The event, uh, as you may have heard, is the second one in a series organized by WAS, WAS is World Academy of Art and Science, and devoted co to contributions of all sciences to sustainability and human security. The series is a part of the Global Campaign on Human Security for All, HS for All, which was initiated, initiated by the UN Trust Fund for Human Security and WAS. It has been going on since January 2023, that campaign. In the first part of the event, as you know, the four speakers will present the materials they have prepared for the occasion. Upon that, we will have a discussion among the speakers and with the audience, if uh, the uh, questions appear from the audience. But I'm inviting the speakers to put questions to each other uh, primarily. We'll include the audience if uh, uh, the time allows that. Thus, the first speaker is Kimberly Montgomery. Kim, please. So um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I wanna thank the World Academy of Art and Sciences for this very kind invitation. And I wanna thank Nabirja and all of his team for the organization and, and putting this together. It's really a privilege and an honor to be uh, with our moderator and our my fellow panelists today. Um, so I'm gonna give a, an overview of sort of what is science diplomacy. And I'm calling in from Washington, DC which is the headquarters of the American Association of the Advancement of Science, where I work for AAAS. And so I am the Director of International Affairs in Science Diplomacy there at AAAS. And what you're seeing on the slide is our building here in Washington, which I am here this morning. Um, and the mission of AAAS is to advance science, engineering, and innovation throughout the world for the benefit of all. And so put more simply, it's to advancing science and serving society. So a lot of scientists, and there might be a lot of scientists on the call, know AAAS as the publisher of the Science and Science Family of Journals, which you see here. But actually AAAS does a lot, a lot more besides that. And so we recently have gone through a new strategic planning process, and these are our four strategic goals. And so I won't go into detail on all of them, um, but they're to advance scientific excellence and achievement, foster equity and inclusion for the scientific excellence, catalyze progress where science meets policy. And the one that I'll focus mostly on my talk is this third one, building trust among scientists and key societal influencers. And so for my work, that really is uh, the diplomatic community, the policymaking community, and really the foreign affairs community at large. And so when we're talking about science diplomacy, I like to sort of go a little bit um, in, in the past a little bit to give you a few examples to kind of set the st stage. And the first one I always like to show is the Antarctic Treaty, which was signed in 1959. Um, this established Antarctica as a natural reserve devoted to peace and science. So it was originally signed by 12 countries and now has more than 50 signatory nations. Um, I like to show this one because if you, if we can remember what is happening in 1959, it's not obvious that you would put Antarctic, Antarctica as a, a peaceful um, natural reserve dedicated to science. And in fact, there were really concerns that this this continent would be used to test to test weapons. The second one I like to show is the U.S. Uh, Japan Cooperative Science Program. Um, and this is a picture in I think it's uh, in the early 60s. You see President, uh, former U.S. President JFK here on the left, and you see the the Japanese leader Kishida on the right, Akita on the right, um, and this is taken in the White House here in Washington D.C. And when the U.S. and Japan normalized their relations again, one of the first things they signed is an agreement to collaborate on science issues that led to this U.S.-Japan cooperative science program that lasted for quite some time. And the third one I, I like to show is this Apollo Suez quotes handshake in 1975. This is at the height of the space race between the United States and the former Soviet Union. Um, and what happened is uh, two spacecraft met in space, uh, one from the US side and one from the former Soviet side. And they actually, and you see this picture on the right, an American astronaut and a Russian cosmonaut actually met and they toured each other's spacecrafts and they had this sort of famous handshake as it's called. And many have attributed this to 
slowing down and changing the space race into one that's more that was more cooperative. And so when we're talking about science diplomacy, I always go back to the AAAS Royal Society Framework for Science Diplomacy. This is a report called The New Frontiers in Science Diplomacy that was published by AAAS and the Royal Society in 2010. And it really laid out a kind of three pillars for what we're talking about when we're talking about science diplomacy. And those three are science for diplomacy, science in diplomacy, and diplomacy for science. And so what do I mean when I'm talking about those pillars? And so the first pillar is science in diplomacy. And so this is really how scientific um, expertise can get into the foreign policy, um, into negotiations, into the policy making. And so on the left-hand side, you see a picture of scientific and uh, policy leaders that were involved in the Iran deal. And then on the right, you see a picture from, from one of the COP meetings. For science for diplomacy, um, this, this can be formal diplomatic uh, processes that really help, uh, help science. And so on the left, you see a picture of CERN. And on the right, you see um, a picture of Sesame, which is in Jordan. Um, and I had the honor of, of touring that last month. And uh, so this actually, sorry about that. That's supposed to be diplomacy for science. Um, so that's when diplomacy helps actually science. And so sorry about that typo there. And this is science for diplomacy, which is when you're using the soft power of, of science to really connect uh, scientific communities and nations when the official relations might be strained or severed. And what you see on the left is Norm Newrider, who used to work at AAAS, and he's actually giving a presentation in, in North Korea. And then on the right, you see a picture from the Pogwash co uh, conferences in the early 80s where you have a British researcher and a Soviet researcher talking together. And so I think at this point, I like to pause and say that um, science diplomacy is not another word for international scientific cooperation. And the reason is the motivation is different. So the motivation for international scientific cooperation is to advance science. And so we want you know, publications with co-authors from all over the world so that we can have the best science possible, but that doesn't mean that that's science diplomacy. And the motivation for science diplomacy is to affect relationships. And so I'm gonna just end by saying a little bit about what we're doing here at AAAS for science diplomacy. We have a center for science diplomacy that was established in July, 2008, and it focuses on three strategic goals. The first is relationship building. So both to create relationships at the sort of high, country to country level, and then also the uh, key international science policy stakeholders between nations, but also to really do that um, uh, science, science for diplomacy. So how do we use the soft power of science to really connect uh, scientific communities? And I'll give you a couple examples next. Um, and then to really, the second thing we're focused on is to build a cohesive science diplomacy stakeholder community. And the third is to do some training. And so like I mentioned for the relationship building, that starts at the high level. And so what you're seeing here is this is our uh, CEO of AAAS, Sudip Parikh. And he's re, uh, this is him with the former executive of CAS, which is China Association of Science and Technology. And they're renewing their MP together. This is Sudip again with uh, the JST president, Japan uh, Science and Technology Agency, um, meeting earlier this month in Japan. Uh, and that's Dr. Hajimoto with Sudip. And then the other thing is really working at the soft power science for diplomacy. And AAAS has done a lot of work in Cuba since the late 1990s. So long before the US and Cuba normalized relations, though those relationships are very, uh, continued to be strained. This is uh, a picture of, of suit of our CEO with our then president of AAAS, now chair of our board, Dr. Gilda Barabino in Cuba. And we re-signed our MOU last year which then led to this um, This past March, we went back down to Havana to actually host a professional meeting where uh, academic scientists, people from the NGO community, the non-governmental organization community, as well as government scientists that were focused on public health and the environment actually came to Cuba. We were able to bring them um, and start actually meeting their counterparts. They had a number of sessions. Here you see people actually from the National Institutes of Health from the U.S., um, talking about uh, public health issues. And here you see two uh, folks from the non from the NGO world talking about environmental issues. 
um, and how the, the U.S. and Cuban scientific communities could, could work together. Um, we are delighted that there's been more collaboration between um, U.S. and Cuban scientists since this meeting in March. Um, real quickly due to time, we also work on community building. We do this a, a lot of different ways, um, but a number of, of ways through our science and diplomacy, which is our online publication. We've started an ambassador conversation series. Here you see the ambassador from Panama to the United States talking about science diplomacy issues. Panama has a national strategy for science diplomacy, which is one of the reasons we, we wanted to interview Ambassador Martinez. We've also interviewed national science advisors. Here you see Dr. Mona Niemer, who is the chief science advisor for Canada. We've also tried to say what are sort of the key issues that are facing science diplomacy and do a special issue where we want pieces from both the scientific side and the diplomatic side talking about things like emerging technologies. And finally, we do some training in science diplomacy. A lot of that we do with the World Academy of Sciences in, in Italy. And so here you see a picture of the course a few years back. We did have to move the course online due to the pandemic, but we're delighted that this picture on the right is from this past summer in, uh, in June when we were down in Trieste. And so one key change that we've made to this course uh, to really drive stronger connections between the scientific and foreign affairs community is that since 2021, participants of this course have been pairs of a scientist and a diplomat or policymaker taking the course together. And so it's been, it was a delight to actually see them engage in person. Um, and we've had this, this course is, is focused mainly on the global South, but we've had a number of European participants as well. And in this course this past year, we had a, a great participant pair from Serbia as well. To do all of this work, we have a, a number of international partners from the Royal Society, which I mentioned we did the framework with them and continue to work with them, or the World Academy of Sciences, where we do our course. Um, we obviously have a, a deep connection with the Cuban Academy of Sciences that we do all our work. This is a picture of us with, the, with members of the Royal Scientific Society um, at the World Science Forum in Cape Town last December. And so I just wanted to close, I do want to be conscious of my time, and hopefully I'm going to put up a slide on opportunities for science diplomacy, and the next slide is challenges for science diplomacy to hopefully drive some conversation in the discussion. For opportunities, I think there are great opportunities. There's huge opportunities to use scientific engagement to foster relationships between countries. And so even just the past two years of trying to work in Cuba, you really start to see the power of science and letting scientists be scientists and how we could actually engage and maybe um, make a small difference there. So there's a huge power there. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity to use, um, to strengthen connections between the scientific and foreign affairs community. I think these communities have been a little bit further apart from each other. And if we wanna see sort of the systemic change in areas or ability to actually solve grand challenges, we're gonna need both of those communities involved. And so we need more bridge builders between the scientific and foreign affairs community. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, I think science diplomacy has a lot of opportunity to reinforce the trust in the international science scientific enterprise. Um, and also I think we could, with things like even this webinar is a great example of really trying to foster a close knit international science diplomacy community which is why I'm excited to participate in this webinar today and really appreciate the invitation. So what are the flip sides of that? What are the challenges? Of course, there are huge challenges. The first one is gonna be really obvious to, to everybody who's on the call, but we are living in a very complex geopolitical environment um, that is changing and that is changing since I even you know, wrote this slide. Um, and we are it's a very challenging environment. We're now having conversations on what does science diplomacy mean in a hot war versus a cold war? And I, I, that may come up in our discussion. But the other thing that's different about the changing geopolitical environment is we're in one where science and technology can actually be the subject of attention between nations. And so how do, what does that mean for science diplomacy when countries are trying to limit what you can, scientific collaboration you can do with certain countries? What does that actually mean? So I think that's, that's certainly a challenge for science diplomacy which goes into sort of exactly the second point is we're in a, a time of increasing rules and limits for what we can do uh, with different nations. So we're in a very competitive um, versus a collaborative kind of, kind of time. 
Um, the other thing that I think is a challenge for science diplomacy is how do you really create true partnerships where there could be some asymmetry in the scientific ca capabilities of those uh, two, two partners? And how do you, we do that at the same time of increasing scientific expertise across the board, um, but really do co-create and have true partnership? And then the, the, the fourth one, surprise anybody, is, you know, I, there aren't unlimited resources here for just even, you know, science investment, but there's certainly not unlimited resources for science and technology engagement. And so my last slide is just to thank everybody. Um, I have a very small team. This is these two, and here's my team here. We have a couple of people, but this is, we have an award for science diplomacy. And so this is one of our award winners, Dr. Singh from last year. And so this is at the AAAS annual meeting where um, he received this award and him and his colleague received it for Seeds Without Borders, which is really trying to share seed varietals and information uh, with, you know, treaties with countries to actually speed up uh, growth and yield issues for food security. So it was really interesting. Um, but here is some information about science diplomacy um, and, and as on former Twitter and then my event here. But um, due to time, I'll, I'll stop sharing now and I look forward to hearing the other panelists and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kim for the presentation. If there are questions, as I have said earlier, let us leave them for the uh, discussion after uh, uh, all the talks. Uh, the Anyway, Monif, uh, you are the sec second speaker, please. Good afternoon, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to be here um, to talk about science diplomacy, a subject that's uh, very dear to my heart. Um, for the next 15 minutes, I would request you to kindly put on your policy making hats and uh, focus on the context of science diplomacy. Uh, we've heard from uh, Mrs. Montgomery from Kimberley about the mechanisms of science diplomacy. I will try and cover a different aspect of, of science diplomacy uh, in my presentation. These are the ideas that I hope to develop. Um, we talk about what's happening on the global uh, scene. Uh, we talk about the sustainable development agenda and how science can and is a tool for, at our disposal to achieve the sustainable development agenda. And then the overlap, if you like, between the sustainable development agenda and the human security program that WAS is championing. Um, I talk um, again, uh, uh, about the value of science as a means to help humanity achieve human security. And I'll end up with one or two um, 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 definitions, if you like, and uh, recommendations um, for all of us to try and adopt in our quest to promote science uh, diplomacy. So what's on the global radar? Um, this is something that we can't escape. This is a quote from Sandeep Waslicker about the current um, situation in the world. Um, an article that he wrote recently, it talks about uh, the two wars currently raging in the Ukraine and the Middle East involving nuclear powers, including Russia and Israel, and that war on the horizon involving two other nuclear powers, the US and China. So I think this is the backdrop that we as policymakers, again, let me remind you, need to look at in our attempt to reread or revisit the narrative of science diplomacy. This is the agenda that has been governing our thinking really since 2015. Um, the um, global goals, the 100 uh, uh, the 17 targets and the 100, uh, the 17 goals and the 169 targets. This has been our compass really since 2015. That is until we face the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in 2020, which not only derailed our plans to achieve the SDGs, but also exposed the weaknesses of national STI ecosystems in all our countries and demonstrated the importance of having um, an indigenous 
advisory capacity in basic and applied research to guide our decision makers and politicians on ways and means to address the pandemic. Um, the very famous journal Nature uh, addressed this in a way a long time ago by talking about interdisciplinarity. Um, uh, the international community of scientists, true, has the responsibility to save the world. However, we need to be aware that many of the big decisions affecting our globe uh, are taken by politicians. So what we have to do is reach out to politicians and try and convey the message emphasizing the value of science diplomacy as a tool of addressing global problems and achieving global peace. Because we have the problem of water globally. This is the amount of fresh water that we have available for us compared to the size of the earth. Air pollution is another issue. Energy is a critical issue that we all face. Many of our countries are energy insecure and we have to utilize the power of science, technology and innovation to address energy insecurity, health, agriculture, biodiversity, climate change. An example of the um, effects of climate change in Eastern and Southern Europe, with many countries not doing as well as countries in Northern Europe in, in mitigating or standing up to climate change phenomena. Plastic pollution and peace. This is one of the essence, essential messages that I feel as scientists we have to try and aim for. Science has to try and achieve global peace, essentially by focusing on national problems, regional problems, and global problems of the type that I've just described, and essentially to try and bring politicians together. Science diplomacy can be a tool that can bring not only scientists together, but we have to try and get politicians to read from the same hymn sheet. We have to try and utilize science to create more wealth in poorer countries. And I refer here also not only to science commercialization, but also to the role of organizations such as the Technology Bank, um, uh, um, founded by the United Nations. Um, this is what it, this is human security. This is, if you like, the other side of the coin of sustainable development or the sustainable development goals. Essentially, there's a lot of harmony or overlap, if you like, between the sustainable development goals and what was the organization to which I and Nabush and others belong to have defined in terms of the seven dimensions of human security. We talk about economic security, food, health, environmental, personal, community security, security and political security. This is the old slide again. Um, and science, we cannot emphasize enough that science is too important to be left to scientists or alone or politicians alone. Science is the engine of prosperity and is a vehicle par excellence to build, to build bridges between cultures and civilizations. So this is the context in which I would like to talk about science diplomacy. And indeed, to quote two of my science diplomacy champions, if you like, Mike Clegg, the former U.S. Um, um, Foreign Secretary of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, very good friend of mine, now retired, who, who talks about science as dealing exclusively with argument based on evidence. And our eminent friend, Ismail Sirajuddin, talking about science being about excellence. So science, by in itself really takes the moral high ground when it comes to reaching out to other cultures, other countries and other civilizations. Uh, diplomacy, on the other hand, is the art or the science, if you like, and the means by which nations, groups and individuals conduct their affairs in ways to safeguard their interests and promote their political, economic, cultural and scientific relations while maintaining peaceful relations. 
So science diplomacy is a process whereby science collaborations among nations are used to address common problems and build constructive partnerships. This is essential. I see science diplomacy. I indeed see stakeholders involved in the promotion of science diplomacy as getting really involved in spreading peace. Um, this is something that uh, um, Kimberly referred to a moment ago. I repeat that because it's important. It's really the proper framework for us to think about science diplomacy. Um, and being um, uh, a member of the AAAS myself, I thought I'll, 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 I'll give the AAAS a little plug as well whilst talking about science diplomacy. Um, in science diplomacy, we're not talking only about bilateral and multilateral relationships. We have to apply science diplomacy broadly. Um, uh, we have to develop the concept so that it not only affects political decisions, it affects um, all the stakeholders and encourages the stakeholders to adopt science diplomacy as a means of not only standing to problems, but of also bringing people together. Now, the problem we face is that uh, politicians think differently to scientists. Politicians are interested in budgets. They're concerned. They have their own perception of national, regional, and global security, whilst scientists are perceived by politicians as um, um, eccentric individuals, perhaps, who spend their hours and hours doing their lab work without due interest in public affairs or in reaching out to the public to get their scientific messages across. And this is the difference between politicians and scientists. The aim of politicians is basically security, and, and continuity, continuity, and being here tomorrow. While science should aim to being here in a better tomorrow. H human security, the key to human security is that we mitigate, eliminate, and address risks. I'd, uh, over and above the examples that Kimberly mentioned, I'd mentioned this as, to my mind, the moment when um, politicians decided to get together and re-establish um, diplomatic relations with help and support from the international community, um, non-state uh, non -state, uh, stakeholders. Um, this is a very famous book that came out in 1980 that talks about this. It was the first time that brought uh, that a meeting brought together the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the Russian the Soviet Academy of Sciences, Australian and the British Royal Society, I think, um, published back in 1980. And I think it talks about science diplomacy for non-state actors, for academies of sciences in particular. Um, these are the non-state actors, if you like, that have been involved in science diplomacy, including WAS, including the AAAS, including the networks of academies of sciences around the world, including the IAP, the Inter-Academy Partnership, um, and of course, the academy to which I belong, WAS, um, and the US National Academy of Sciences, which um, for a long time devoted a lot of time, energy, and effort into trying to bridge political divides between countries, between the US and countries of the Middle East, I acknowledge with um, uh, uh, great um, uh, 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 satisfaction the efforts of people like Bruce Alberts, Mike Clegg, John Borite, and others who for a very long time reached out to uh, Muslim majority countries in terms of, um, and attempted to bridge divide divides successfully, again, between the political US and the political countries of the of the Middle East. Um, WAS is doing the same thing. Uh, WAS's flagship program for the last year or so has been human security for all, as Nabusha mentioned, in collaboration with the United Nations Trust Fund 
for human security. And this is an example already mentioned by Kimberly on um, a manifestation of regional science diplomacy efforts in the form of SESAMI, which is an international research center based around 20 miles from where I'm speaking to you right now uh, in Alan, Jordan. And uh, it has eight members, Cyprus, Egypt, Iran, Israel, Jordan, Pakistan, Palestine, and Turkey. Um, uh, it's a UNESCO Jordanian project that has really brought the scientists of these countries together in a noble enterprise that <clears throat> should have um, influence on bilateral and multilateral relations between the member countries um, of, of Sesame. Um, individual champions of science diplomacy historically, uh, I talk about Professor Salam, uh, Nobel Laureate, 1979, Professor Zuwail, one of the three uh, uh, presidential envoys um, to the Islamic world, uh, appointed by uh, President Obama, along with Bruce Alberts and uh, Zarhouni, I think, of the National Institute of Health back in 2009. Um, uh, Professor Zachary uh, of the International Science Council, another champion of science diplomacy, who really believes that given the right context and the right tools, science diplomacy can be a means to bridge divides between countries, cultures, uh, civilizations, and bring about socioeconomic development uh, for everybody. History of science is an example that I have been involved in. Um, here we have a Columbia professor in the middle, Professor George Saliba, um, her, who is a historian of science, totally dedicated to, to highlighting the fact that we are as civilizations interdependent and have historically been interdependent on each other. Uh, another professor, Professor Charles Falco of um, uh, University of um, um, in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and uh, another science journalist friend of mine, Miss Nadia Al Awadi, who devo devoted a lot of time and effort to really promoting the message of peace through science, sci the scientific enterprise and science diplomacy. These are the operative paragraphs, the operative items that I think um, any science diplomat uh, or indeed politician can and should look at in terms of the science diplomacy protocols. I'm sure you're quite aware of them. Um, but I think I will focus on, on, on this one, on better conditions for scientific activities due to the contribution of foreign policy agendas and improved interfaces between science and public policies. This is an essential message that we have to focus on in terms of reaching out to decision makers in our midst and to convince them of the value of science as a means to achieve not only the SDGs, but global peace as well. This is my last slide. Um, I'll mention that uh, my bottom line is this, is that our world today is in turmoil and humanity, humanity is facing a variety of threats and indeed existential threats. Science, the STI ecosystems empower us to stand up to such challenges. The, the SDGs and human security components are essentially two sides of the same coin. Countries, cultures, and civilizations may have many differences, including political differences. That, however, should not prevent them from collaborating through channels of science and science diplomacy to address common problems and even bridge political divides. And this is my a dove of peace to conclude my presentation and thank you very much. Thank you, Marif. It was a rich presentation, a number of uh, interesting things. Now let us move on. Anna, now is your turn, please. 
Okay, thank you very much. And I'm uh, very lucky to follow on from these very nice uh, talks. I will be talking to you about a specific example, which it's maybe not science diplomacy in its purest definition, but it's um, science, the, the science policy interface at work. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, how it works, the influence it's had on international policymaking, and a quick tour of some of the key findings from the latest assessment. So the IPCC has just completed its sixth assessment report, and um, it comprises of these six reports plus a synthesis report. And this is really the state of knowledge on climate change today. And you can see that there are some focus topics um, such as the ocean and cryosphere, the land, and uh, the famous special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees, what that means. But we see the main um, climate report components in light blue. So the IPCC addresses the physical science basis of climate change, impacts, adaptation, vulnerability, future risks of climate change, and mitigation options. So it's interesting to see back in history over the past uh, 30 or so years, since the IPCC was established um, back in 1988, the, the role it's had in shaping international cooperation around the common problem uh, of climate change. So successively, we've had um, the first, um, the far first assessment report, the second assessment report, as you see below each report, there's an important step in international uh, policies. So particularly after the first assessment report, this stimulated the establishment of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC. From there on, we reached the Kyoto Protocol. Um, adaptation was added as a component of the assessments um, in around 20, the early 20, 2000s. And then when we reached the fourth assessment report, where the so-called two degree guardrail, or shall we say limit beyond which there is uh, what was considered dangerous effects of climate change were assessed and from that point, um, the organization was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, given its critical role in, um, in informing science-based policymaking on climate change. The last assessment report, um, the AR5, excuse me, not the second last, was what underpinned the establishment of one of the most, um, I think, successful outcomes of um, the science policy interface, which was the establishment of the Paris Agreement. And at that point, it's interesting to see that the tables turned. So the Paris, from the Paris Agreement itself, from, from the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, there was a request into the IPCC um, to provide an assessment on key uh, knowledge. But there, were, there were key knowledge gaps around the implications of reaching global warming of 1.5 degrees. So this was inscribed within the Paris Agreement. Um, after that, we've had the sixth assessment report, as I said, and now we're going towards a new mechanism which has been established through the Paris Agreement, which is um, a process of, of a global stock take of ambitions on mitigation, adaptation and finance. So the first one is taking place shortly in Dubai at the next COP um, this November. And then um, five years after that, there will be the second global stock take and so on. So now we're starting the seventh assessment cycle and it will be really informing this critical decade and these milestones for the international policy community. And in the backdrop of this slide, I think it's important to notice these growing body of, of scientific uh, literature, the research on climate change. There's an ever increasing involvement of stakeholders. So while the international policy making sphere was our main um, audience or customer as it were from the IPCC, we're now increasingly being sought after by um, city planners, um, national policy, um, the, the public, um, civil society, and so on. So the, the audience is broadening for this information. So it's, it's really a unique science policy interface, as I said, and the preparation of these reports is really worth, worth talking about um, just for a moment. The reports, um, first and foremost, are neutral with respect to policy choices, and this is really critical, uh, particularly when referring back to what Monif was saying around trust and actually, Kimberly, I think you mentioned this, the importance of trust for um, the scientific community. So the neutrality of the IPCC is critical here. 
and also that the IPC does not conduct its own research. Um, it's an assessment of the evidence, um, the technical, socioeconomic and scientific evidence that's in the peer reviewed literature. And scientists from across the world are um, nominated by governments and then selected through the scientific leadership of the IPCC to become authors of this um, important process. And the reports, they go through a very rigorous iterative process um, by which the drafting takes place. At each stage of the drafting, there is um, a formal review process. So the, the documents become available for experts to register and provide uh, reviews. Every single review comment that's received must be responded to by the author teams. And all of this becomes public at the end when the report is finalized and published. And the very last step, which you see on this diagram, is an approval process of the summary for policymakers. And I'll come to that in just a moment. So just to explain what a report consists of, as you see, this is one example. Um, the, this is information based on the climate report of the physical science basis, where on the far left, you see 14,000 publications were assessed. And then the report is prepared with a very traceable line of sight to the original publications. And the authors condense the findings all the way to a summary for policymakers. So going from around 2,500 pages of scientific evidence and a discussion of that to transmitting the assessment statements of that assessment um, into a document that's um, directed towards policymakers. If we look at the climate report across the three main components, it's really, I think, quite remarkable to see what a Herculean effort this actually is. So you'll see, I find, a quite a relatively compact um, team of authors for each report coming from many different countries. And if you look at the quantity of literature that's assessed by these authors, it's happening over a, around about a three year period, all of this. And I really um, want to emphasize this um, transparent and very rigorous process to address the review comments. And you'll see what a volume we're talking about many, many tens of thousands of review comments to which the authors um, formally respond to, and you can find all of this available on the IPCC website. So the role of national delegates is um, also a very interesting one. Um, they co-develop the structure of the report. They take part in the review process as experts themselves, and they approve the summary for policymakers line by line with authors. So the, the connection and the relationship between authors and, and the policymakers is really um, at a, a sort of strengthened to the, the, the most, I think, most interesting and intense uh, characteristic at the approval of the summary for policymakers. And so here are a few images to show you what this is like. Um, we have an intergovernmental session. So uh, countries are represented, all 153 member countries, and they discuss the summary for policymakers with the co-chairs, with the scientific leadership and the leading authors of the reports. And it's it's literally line by line. So before um, a, a sentence or a figure is is adopted, it's it's literally gaveled down in a in an approval decision. You'll find that there are many sort of dimensions and and the representation of of the information needs coming from policymakers from different parts of the world has to continue to be discussed until the very end. And and this turns into a very intense discussion with the authors and also directly with the policymakers in, in various different settings during the session. So one thing that I, I think is also very important to understand is that the, the, the in the approval context, in the IPCC, there's a common agreement and common um, you know, uh, condition to which everybody signs to, um, in, is, which is that it's the science that has the last word. So while this may seem quite a political process, it's actually a very much a science driven process and it's a question of communicating the science, which is policy relevant and as clear as possible to all countries of the world. Here you see another example of uh, what, what it's like to be in the approval session. What you see on the screen is where the green text is that has been gaveled down, it's approved and this is what will be published in the end. You'll see in pink the, the, the sentence that's under discussion at that very point. So um, when we've been through the approval process, we publish the reports and I'm very 
happy to share a very brief tour of some of the key findings. So the, the latest report on the physical assessment of climate change has been very clear in, in stating that recent changes in the climate are widespread, rapid, and they are intensifying. They're also unprecedented in thousands of years. So the, the changes that we see are widespread, they are rapid, as I said, and they're happening in all components of the climate system. These are observations in the atmosphere, the biosphere, the ocean, and the cryosphere. So the synthesis report of the, of the last assessment has um, shown that human activities have unequivocally uh, caused climate change. We see um, since the, the last um, over 100 years, unsustainable use of fossil fuels is, is directly related to the increases in surface temperature that have been observed. And we're able to attribute this change to human um, activities, emissions and land use through multiple methods of attribution. And you'll see on the far right here that the observed warming is um, very much equivalent to the total human influence, which is a mix of um, what is caused by the well-mixed greenhouse gases, which cause a warming and effect, and other human-caused drivers like aerosols, for example, that do cause a cooling effect. Whereas um, the assessment finds that over multiple uh, years, decades, the effects of solar radiate, solar and volcanic drivers and internal variability of the climate system uh, play a very minor role in, in this. So we see this is these are observations of widespread and substantial impacts and related losses and damages that can be attributed to climate change across all systems that affect human and natural well-being and safety and security. So for example, you see here the effects um, the adverse impacts on water availability and food production, health and well-being, um, on infrastructure, cities, but also on the natural system. And we, we see, we are able to show that uh, with every increment of global warming, the regional changes become more widespread and pronounced. So going into the future from the current warming of about 1.1 degrees, we see that as we go into a warming world that reaches 1.5 degrees, you see going down this figure, the effects that this has on the hottest temperature, hottest day temperature around the world, again, for two degrees, three degrees and four degrees into the future possible warmings. And you see how these effects are amplified over the polar regions, over land. Um, and you see also on the bottom of the slide, the effect that this has on soil moisture change. So this is an indicator that can be related to droughts. So while we've seen the, the severity of um, future warming and the consequences, we, we see in this figure um, the urgency of international action that is required. So warming can be limited to one degrees um, or two degrees if um, net zero carbon dioxide is reached. And this requires immediate, rapid and deep reductions in greenhouse gases across all sectors. And you see that the current um, implemented policies are not meeting uh, this, this need um, as we stand. One thing that is very important to notice in the assessment is that there is a very comprehensive assessment of the multiple opportunities that are currently available and are feasible, um, also cost effective for scaling up climate action. So on the right hand side, you see um, mitigation options around energy supply or land, food and water, where on the on the on the left hand side, you see also the effects of adaptation and how there are synergies between um, climate action across adaptation and mitigation. And scrolling through this very complex figure, synthesis figure, you see also other sectors where we see these positive interrelationships around um, actions or facing settlements and infrastructure, health, society, livelihoods and economy, and industry and waste. So, very important uh, final message is that the extent to which current and future generations will experience a better uh, uh, conditions in the future warming world really depends on choices now and in the near term. 
And it's really remarkable, I think, and this figure, this is, I think, most iconic figure from the latest report, it really contextualizes for us, it puts us in the picture. And you can see that a child born today is will probably experience far more um, extremes and more intense extreme events in the future than their grandparents, for example. So really the intergenerational dimension of climate change is captured, but also the choices that lie um, in front of us and the possible future scenarios where these choices then take us. So it's actually at the end uh, a message of hope because as I said, um, there are um, options which have been assessed comprehensively that can um, turn us onto a path where we, we go forward with low or very low uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And it is still possible to limit global warming to um, 1.5 degrees or two degrees by the end of the century. So I stop there. I thank you very much for having invited me um, to this, this panel. And I'm very interested to discuss with you going um, forwards into the AR7, uh, the opportunities and the challenges uh, that the IPCC will be facing. So I'm very interested to hear your views on that. Thank you. Anna, thank you very much for the very informative presentation. Go into detail in your presentation, a number of uh, interesting figures. Thank you very much for the presentation. You have to send me the presentation too, you know that. <laughs> yes, thank you, it's available for everyone, thank you. After, after the meeting. Okay, then let us go on. Uh, Miroslav, uh, we call him Vesco. <laughs> Uh, following his surname, please go on. You are the final speaker. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be uh, in in this webinar. My name is Miroslav Eskovic. Uh, I'm professor of nuclear physics, former rector of the University of uh, Novi Sad. Uh, I was also assistant minister of uh, in the Ministry of uh, Research and in Technological Development, responsible for uh, nuclear safety and security in Serbia, but for uh, last eight years, I was in the European Commission responsible for scientific support, coordination of the scientific support to macro-regional strategies. I'm emphasizing all these things because I was involved in a lot of uh, science diplomacy activities uh, in, different, in different roles. And um, during my presentation, I would like to say a few words about European Union and the new approach to science diplomacy, about the importance of the cohesion policy in Europe, water diplomacy and macro-regional strategy as a science diplomacy in actions, and then macro-regional strategies as an instrument in science diplomacy. Uh, as outlined in the European Union global approach to research and innovation, a stronger focus on science, technology, and innovation in foreign and security policy enables Euro European Union to respond to such challenges while enhancing its resilience and strategic autonomy. Uh, the Council of the European Union has called for the development of European science diplomacy agenda by 2023. The idea is to develop four strands. Uh, the first one, how to use the science diplomacy strategically to tackle mainly geopolitical challenges, then how to uh, make uh, European diplomacy more effective uh, and resilient through scientific evidences and foresight, then how to strengthen science diplomacy in EU and member states in diplomatic missions, for example, and also how to build the capacity for European science diplomacy. Uh, Europe, uh, science diplomacy is very high on the agenda of the Spanish presidency, uh, and uh, in view of that, there, there will be four uh, working groups which are with the task to bring together relevant stakeholders in an innovative format and to develop recommendation in the co-creation process. The first European science diplomacy conference is aid, made in advancing discussion on framework of European science diplomacy in order to strengthen EU outreach, resilience, and capacity to respond to a rapidly changing ge geopolitical and scientific and technological uh, environment. The conference will be also uh, the occasion to celebrate fifth anniversary of the Madrid de Declaration on Science Diplomacy, which has been endorsed by over 200 uh, experts since its adoption in December 2018. Uh, in the meantime, the European Union Science Diplomacy Alliance 
has been uh, has been formed. The European Union Science Diplomacy Alliance is a collaborative initiative launched by the Horizon 2020 Science Diplomacy Project to sustain and grow the network's impact and momentum consolidated by some of the previous project. <clears throat> Uh, another thing which uh, I would like really to emphasize at this moment is that when we see, when we say uh, Europe, uh, I don't mean just European Union, I mean the Europe uh, as a whole, I mean uh, European research area, and we are all aware that there are several international organizations which are based in Europe or organized by uh, Europe, uh, which have a very important uh, role in uh, science diplomacy. CERN uh, has been mentioned several times. Uh, then European Southern Observatory, which uh, has formally accredited its diplomatic representative in Chile, the host country for its telescope. Then uh, another activities of the Director General Joint Research Center, which is very much involved in different uh, science diplomacy uh, topics. Uh, for example, in Arctic, but you will see later it's involved in other uh, activities uh, as well. <clears throat> uh, well, let's go a little bit back uh, and think about relationship within Europe and try to see some European specificity. Uh, Europe and the whole world are facing problem of increasing uh, income and wealth uh, inequality. So inequalities are uh, severe obstacle to sustainable and balanced, balanced growth. That's one of the main reasons why the cohesion policy in Europe and European Union is response to this development differences between countries and regions and the role of regions in the EU has been strengthened more and more. Scientific collaboration and science diplomacy are important tool to strengthen European cohesion policy. In view of that, I would like to mention that water diplomacy is a new field of diplomacy that combines the method of science diplomacy, focusing on close, close ties between the world of science and diplomacy with traditional diplomatic instruments. We are all aware that a lot of uh, issues related to water uh, are now more and more important. Within one of the science diplomacy project within Horizon 2020. The authors did a case study on water diplomacy, uh, its future in the national, regional, European and global uh, environment. Uh, EU uh, inspired by the water, the diplomacy and the support of, and in support of the cohesion policy, Europe developed four macro regional strategy the Baltic Sea strategy, the Danube strategy, the Adriatic Union strategy, and the Alpine uh, strategy. Those macro regional strategies represent a new tool of European Union and government that seeks to combine a community's territorial cooperation and cohesion policies. All uh, strategies address wellness and prosperities of the region through research and innovation, which is an important policy area for all macro regional strategies. The Danube has the most international river basin in the world. The Nubian countries, however, managed to turn the hydrological and political complexity of the basin into the source of exemplary cooperation and integration. Uh, one uh, issue which is uh, very interesting is the uh, European Union strategy for the Danube region as enabling factor for science diplomacy and for the development of this region. This uh, macro regional strategy is in the same time the instrument for science diplomacy, but also an instrument of the cohesion for the cohesion policy. Within that, I would like to emphasize one specific project, which is called Danube Inconet project, uh, with uh, the main goal really to support implementation of the European Union strategy for the Danube region, to support uh, science uh, and uh, innovation and uh, science diplomacy within the region. Uh, and uh, I would like really specifically to mention what has been mentioned in the first uh, in the first presentation, 
uh, this project is also responsible to create partnership uh, between uh, countries and region with asymmetric capacities uh, in research and uh, innovation. Uh, Joint Research Center as part of the European Commission uh, is uh, very much dedicated to support this kind of uh, activities. Uh, in 2011, JRC signed an agreement with uh, the Academies of Sciences of the Danube region of the member state. And it was basically the beginning and the start of scientific support to the Danube region, but also to all macro regional uh, strategies. The initiative was open to all the other countries and all the other national academies from the Danube, Danube uh, region to join in and to contribute and benefit from common activities in the partnership. Let me just remind all of us that the Danube River Basin cover uh, nine EU countries and five non-EU countries, including Western Balkan, Ukraine, and Moldova. Uh, Science, um, European European uh, Academy of Science and Art uh, took a task to put together national academies from the Danube region and to uh, organize uh, every year meetings of the National Academy of Science and uh, Arts dedicated to to the Danube. Uh, macro region and uh, one of them, one of such was dedicated to science diplomacy. It was uh, in Prague in 20, 2019. Uh, another thing which I would like really to emphasize is uh, at the moment is uh, that uh, we need to involve young people in science uh, diplomacy. And uh, the Austrian Federal Ministry for Education, Science and Research uh, and the Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe created the Nubius Award in 2011 with the intention to honor persons with extraordinary achievements in their scientific uh, activities and outputs related to the Danube Region. As part of that, 14, sign, 14 young scientists are granted every year this award, one for each country that is part of the EU strategy for the Danube region, as I mentioned, from the EU, but also from uh, non-EU countries. The award seeks to highlight the scientific work and talent of young researchers and enhance the visibility of the scientific community in the region. Uh, in order to support that activity, Joint Research Center uh, organize every year visit of young scientists to uh, Isprat, one of the JRC site uh, in Ispra in Italy. And in principle, uh, when we talk about new generation of science, uh, science diplomats, uh, on this slide, you can see uh, one such visit to Ispra uh, in 2019, the area of expertise of those young uh, awardees ranges from biology to modern history, migration, water treatment, pharmaceutical engineering, cybercrime and communication. So all those different topics uh, and uh, they, as I said, they come from very different countries and very different region. At this point, I would like really to emphasize something very specific as a, uh, a link between macro-regional uh, concept and science diplomacy. Science diplomacy can, stop, can provide a jump start to certain uh, diplomatic activities, but it is also a long-term effort to, uh, re which requires really sustained collaboration between scientists and, and policymakers. In a similar way, macro-regional strategies uh, and macro-regional concept is a strategic one. So it's not just a project which uh, lasts from one year to uh, for the next three or four years. It is a strategy, it is a long-term process, and in such a way it is really combined with, uh, with uh, science, science diplomacy uh, efforts. Coming from the Western Balkan, I think uh, I should mention uh, science diplomacy in relation to the Western, to the Western Balkan. At the request of the German, German federal government, the Leopoldina, as a German national academy, took the lead in the area of science, education, and society. And this uh, Academy of Science brought together key national stakeholders of the education, science, and science system in the newly founded 
platform, the so-called Joint Science Conference of the Berlin Process. As you can see, the seventh Joint Science Conference took place uh, a few weeks ago in Tirana. Uh, and uh, that is another opportunity to work together in the region where uh, problems uh, are uh, so-called so uh, permanent. Uh, this is this is a slide of the last of the last uh, meeting which took place uh, in Tirana, uh, partnering for excellence, partnering uh, for for Europe. In support to this activity, the steering platform on research and innovation for the Western Balkan uh, has been established long time ago, and very recently a project called Policy Answers. Uh, with the idea really to put more than 100 participants from 19 European countries to talk about uh, different crucial topics in the region, digital, green, and health path pathway. The policy dialogue is a kickoff of the EU Western Balkan policy dialogue stakeholders platform, which will continue to work together. And... Uh, Towards the end, uh, I would like really to uh, mention that uh, we really hope that science diplomacy will continue, can continue really to uh, support our efforts. But it should be mentioned that multi-level science diplomacy is a future, is probably a future of science diplomacy going beyond nation state. Science diplomacy is increasingly taken by cities, by state and regional government, by transnational companies and civil society groups. Thus, I hope a proper balance on this CISO could be established in a better way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vesco. The discuss the discussion part of the session, and I'm using the privilege of being the moderator to to put uh, the questions first. And my first question goes to Kim, and it is the following. I, I guess you have heard. I sent you a message uh, this morning that the UN General Assembly proclaimed in August this year the International Decade of Sciences for Sustainable Development that will be going on to, from 2024 to 2031. I am quite sure that science diplomacy with all its pillars will be very much needed in the implementation of the overall decades program. There will be the overall program, but different scientific organizations will contribute to that in different countries. Does AAAS plan to contribute to the preparation of this program now and participate in its implementation. Kim? Well, thank you so much for, for the question. And yes, we, we are following that. Um, and I think it science diplomacy will have a, a huge role in that. So it reminds me a little bit of the STI for SDG roadmaps that that process that was going forward. And, and one of my colleagues, Bill Colblazer, was really instrumental in that. But I think when you look at sort of the, the decade, it's gonna take all three pillars of, of help from science diplomacy. Certainly science in diplomacy, how are you actually sort of ad advising and getting the scientific expertise into, into the plans and into the implementation, which will be really important. Um, diplomacy for science will also be really important if we're going to achieve the goals that are outlined in that as well. And then I do think there's also a role for science for diplomacy because it will take sort of crossing borders and, and lots of different countries and stakeholders working together to, to kind of achieve the, the science for sustainable development that, that you want. In regards to whether AAAS itself will, will participate, I think that's, that's ongoing. Um, I do think it's very exciting that if you look at that resolution, it also tasks UNESCO with some roles and responsibilities there or highlights that. Um, and certainly in the U.S., we're excited that the U.S. recently rejoined UNESCO. Um, and so thinking about ways we could um, collaborate on that as well. So um, I think I'm really happy to, to see that. Look forward to the decade going forward. I'll have a concrete uh, proposal at the end. But uh, just to know that on December the 15th this year, an event will happen at CERN, 
it will be the final event within the international year for, of basic sciences for sustainable development, but it will also be the event to announce the beginning of the decade on September the 15th at CERN, a high level meeting to proclaim the decade. Uh, but in any case, as you have mentioned, UNESCO is the main organizer of all that, but there are a number of organizations. I had three, four hundred international organizations will be want to participate in that. Just follow that, and we might meet there. <laughs> so, oh, that. I'm, we very, can meet I'm very sure of that. Okay, now my question to Monif. Uh, we have seen, we know that you are active in four international, at least four international scientific organizations. Was the Academy of Engineering and Technology for Developing World, the Inter uh, Action Council, and the World Sustainability Forum. But what can you tell us about the cooperation of these mutual organizations, cooperation of these organizations with each other related to the problems to be addressed and solved on the international level? That is, are there science diplomatic activities in a way coordinated? Thank you. Thank you, Nabusha, for a, a very interesting question. Well, the short answer to your question really is that uh, um, although I'm involved in the organizations you mentioned, but um, actually each organization has its own uh, mandate and its own agenda. Um, the Interaction Council for which I am the science advisor, is essentially a club of former heads of state uh, uh, and prime ministers and presidents of countries. And I have found, in fact, that many decision makers and politicians, after leaving office, um, become interested in human development, in human security, and in science, perhaps a little bit more than they did when they were in office. And I try to capitalize on that in terms of getting them to champion uh, causes and issues uh, that uh, affect all of us. Issues such as climate change, um, food insecurity, uh, water insecurity, and so on and so forth. Um, the underlying philosophy that I adopt is that, um, and, and this was what I tried to reflect in my presentation, is that those of us from the scientific community often end up talking to ourselves without reaching out to the people who take the decisions. Uh, even today, Nebusha, despite of your best efforts, uh, I think out of the 20 or so participants, we are all in the members of the STI ecosystem, and um, only one or two belong to the um, polity or the uh, um, politics uh, ecosystem um, uh, uh, in our countries and internationally. So um, with the Interaction Council, with the other organizations in which I'm involved, um, I have found it to be more effective to try and convince the decision makers of certain things that uh, they are not aware of. Many politicians are not aware of the value of science as a means to address their national problems um, their um, socioeconomic development uh, issues, um, their environmental issues, uh, and uh, um, other issues uh, that science can address. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the scientists themselves are very often, and in many parts of the world, somehow hesitant are somehow hesitant to collaborate to really make a meaningful difference to the lives of ordinary people. 
um, as uh, Kim mentioned in her presentation, scientists find it easier to collaborate in terms of joint books or publications. However, in terms of implementing uh, programs on the ground to um, address uh, human issues, uh, 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 you know, we have we have a problem. So um, I think it's the role of academies, of sciences, to reach out to politicians, to really show um, the public, uh, our decision makers, our business community, that science is probably the best tool we have to address our global problems. Without science, we wouldn't have known about climate change, nor would we be able to develop uh, strategies to address climate change. Without science, we wouldn't have been able to address our food insecurity issues around the world, uh, nor would we uh, have been able to um, uh, address uh, water problems. Without science, in fact, a more recent example, we wouldn't have been able to develop the vaccine that helped us um, address the pandemic a few months ago or a year ago. So I think this is the message that we have to try and um, uh, get across to our uh, politi uh, political communities around the world, um, because um, very often politicians tend to get immersed in their political problems and not pay enough attention or in, in, indeed invest substantially in the scientific enterprise. And this is a problem that bioscience di diplomacy, I think we can address. Okay, uh, well, my feeling is, uh, that's why I uh, put that question that in, at least in some cases, uh, a collaborative approach of uh, uh, several international scientific organizations to the policymakers would be useful and would give better results. I do not see such activity around in, in, in my uh, neighborhood. Okay, that was the basis of my question. Thank you for your answer. And uh, my, uh, as I have said, I wanted to put a question to Anna, but she has uh, responded to, to, to my question in a very rich way. Uh, thus, I'm giving a question to Miroslav. You were talking about the EU water diplomacy and mentioned the objective to make it a multidisciplinary science-based diplomacy. But which disciplines are included in, in this approach? You, you said multidisciplinary. Which disciplines do you include in that? Thank you for the question. Uh, well, uh, water diplomacy is not something very new. So it started a long time, long time ago. And uh, water diplomacy include not only uh, biological sciences, uh, uh, technical sciences as well, but also social sciences and social, social issues and social uh, problems. Uh, I would like to remind all of us that uh, Europe uh, started to develop so-called missions within Horizon, Horizon Europe. One of the missions uh, <clears throat> is uh, Mission Oceans, which is dedicated to development of uh, mission approach to problem of water, not only in Europe, but worldwide. And as part of that, so there are, there are uh, scientific calls for all sort of different different topics, which will be dealing with uh, uh, ecosystem reconstruction, about uh, nature-based solution for such things as well, uh, but also, as I said, social social things and social components uh, and social approach to uh, those those issues. Uh, the Danube uh, region is very specifically mentioned in that uh, mission uh, to restore our uh, water worldwide uh, as one of the lighthouses. And I uh, strongly support the activities of all the, uh, all the people 
who are and all the institutions with who are uh, involved in that. Uh, we are very much involved here at the University of Novi Sad, trying to uh, support that activity and involving all sorts of stakeholders from academia, but also from, from uh, public institutions as well, and so on. Uh, I've seen the Gary's uh, question in the chat. Uh, would you like uh, me and can I just mention a few things in relation to, to his uh, question or you would like really to deal with that in a different way? Okay, is this the question put by Gary Jacobs you're talking yes. about? Yes. Okay, just, just to mention, Gary Jacobs is the president and uh, CEO of the World Academy of Art and Science. And uh, let me uh, uh, read the questions. It's put to all of you or each of you. But uh, let me first put the question, then you may uh, uh, answer it. The question is, how are scientists and their organizations prepared or trained to resist the pressure of challenges to their findings and recommendations, either by their own national governments or by other that assert bias due to their own vested interests? If, if I may start, yeah, if I may start, uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, I, I am a scientist, but I was involved in different uh, organization. And for the last uh, eight years, I was a part of the uh, European Commission Joint Research Center, which is basically interface between science and by itself and scientific organization and uh, policy makers, which are part of the European Commission. Uh, I'm strongly supporting scientific approach to uh, different, different topics uh, and providing scientific evidences for policy making. Uh, what we have to be aware that politics is not only rational. We, from the science uh, point of view and from the science organization, we are used to be rational. On the other hand, politics is not necessarily rational, always. Politics involves uh, values, uh, education, culture as well, and so on. And so uh, scientific organizations should try to provide scientific evidences and to present them in a way that it is understandable to politicians, not only understandable to our colleagues, scientists, but we have to present them uh, in, the, in the way that it is understandable and the consequences which are understandable for uh, politicians. And then politicians are responsible for taking them into account, but also, as I said, taking into account other things uh, which politics is uh, based on. Thank you. Okay, does any of the sister want to respond to the question too about the pressure? Uh, yeah. Anna, I will respond. Yeah, I, wrote, I was writing a, you know, a response while we were talking earlier and um, I very much agree with Miroslav's response about the scientific um, approach, but I wanted to add also this dimension of um, the, the, the visibility and exposure that the IPCC process gives to scientists that join the process which is a, a double-edged sword. On the one hand, they're able to um, communicate much more directly with policymakers in their countries and regions, but also they no doubt feel pressure, um, both political, but also from the media, I would say. Um, so we really emphasize distinguishing which hat they wear uh, when speaking. So the IPCC is a very important trusted mechanism, which is by definition policy neutral, so presenting on behalf of the IPCC is one thing, um, presenting as their, you know, their own opinion is another, and it's very important that they distinguish these. So, uh, but basically, I just wanted to intervene to agree 100% with what Miroslav said, which is an excellent answer. Thank um, you. I can, I can add something here, uh, Nabusha. Um, in answering Gary's question, I think um, scientists very often are not really qualified to address um, questions or concerns raised by uh, politicians um, um, historically that is because scientists and politicians in many parts of the world 
they come from two different worlds and two different backgrounds. Science is uh, time-bound, indicator-bound, um, whilst politics focuses on uh, uh, sh the short term. It focuses on the 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 the, the framework that governs. Uh, the scientific enterprise is quite different to the framework that governs uh, politics. And politicians are very much um, um, uh, aware of public opinion, of parliaments, of the pressure imposed on them by parliaments, by the public, and so on and so forth. And this is where I think the role of academies of sciences becomes critical as the collective voice of science in reaching out to politicians collectively and presenting sound arguments. And secondly, the role of the science advisor to the president or the prime minister or the head of state in terms of bridging the divide between the science community and decision-making circles. Um, and thirdly, the role of science journalists Science journalists have the capacity to rephrase some of the scientific ideas that scientists come up with and frame them in such a way that would make them um, more comprehensible by, by politicians. Uh, but the divide is there, and it's critical that we all try to bridge this divide so that um, we get more champions of science from decision-making circles. I'll just add, I, I really I appreciate the question and I really appreciated a lot of the, the very good answers by my fellow panelists. Um, and to sort of take uh, the last comments on how to bridge the divide between the scientists and the uh, policymakers, which is, which is a divide. Um, AAAS has a number of programs to try to do both, build trust with, with policymakers and other key societal influencers, and also to make sure that we're getting evidence-based policy. Um, and I'll just mention a couple of those. One is that AAAS for the last 50 years has been running a science technology policy fellowship program where it places scientists in either the U.S. Congress and uh, members of Congress office or committees um, or into the executive branch. Uh, so all the different agencies or ministries here in the United States. It's been a, a very successful program. And a lot of sort of um, alumni of that program uh, stay in policy and actually our OCP director, who is our scientific advisor to the president is a former alum of that program, uh, Dr. Provocker. Um, the other one uh, I'll mention two more is the EPI Center, which is really working at sort of the, the state level of doing a deeper dive in different scientific issues and working with governors and other state policymakers so they've done a lot of sort of conveying really good evidence-based policy for things like forever chemicals and PFAS and, and um, or voting and, and lots of other topics. Um, and the third thing, because when he mentioned it, it was journalists, we also have a, a mass uh, a media communication fellowship where places scientists in, um, in either like a print journalist or TV uh, media where they can do a, a better job of trying to get the scientific expertise into journalism. We also have a program called Sideline, where it tries to pair a, a local researcher with a journalist. So if they're writing a story and they need somebody to comment in the next you know, 48 hours or whatever like that, they can actually get scientific expertise in from the, the region in the United States. So it's certainly one that AAAS has been focusing on a long time on bridging that divide, which is really important. Thank you, Kim. Uh, there is another question from the audience. Uh, uh, Ralph Wolf, a WAS fellow, has put a question, the following question. Uh, how are scientists dealing with the emotional impact of climate change and mass extinction, psychological impact of those things? How are scientists dealing with that? Are, you, are, are they aware of that? How do they react to that? Well, if I may, uh, this is not directly my topic, but I would like really to mention that more and more we have uh, climate change uh, activities in relation to the mental health. And so that's that's the way how different organization and different uh, scientific scientific uh, topics are put together. And I I'm, I'm think that different organizations are more and more working uh, 
together to really put uh, effort into understanding how climate change is influencing our mental health. Okay. Uh, now, well, do, do you have a question to, uh, there are some questions to each other? I'm uh, referring to the speakers. Yeah, I think, I think here it's again important to um, think of um, bridging the divide between pure and applied sciences and social sciences. Um, uh, in many instances, in many institutions and academies of sciences, rightly, there has been a genuine attempt in order to assess the impact, for example, of climate change on um, psychological impact of climate change or other um, uh, dangers on human um, well-being, um, um, I think we really need to revisit this effort to bridge the divide between pure and applied and medical sciences and social sciences. Um, that is important, again, in order to um, build up the culture of science within the public mindset, which is important, because in many parts of the world, for various reasons, the public mindset is not as appreciative of, of science and the scientific enterprise as it should. So here again, I think this is um, an important area where uh, some work needs to be done in order to assess all the aspects related, not only the quantitative aspects, but also the qualitative and psychological aspects of, phenom of, of a phenomenon such as climate change. Thank you, Monif. Okay, uh, we are uh, close to the uh, to the end uh, of the meeting, and uh, I'm very satisfied with all what we have heard just to know that uh, all the material will be placed on the WAS website. You will be informed about that. I'll ask the speakers about the material in the forthcoming days, just to complete the material. Then uh, the WAS administration will arrange that in the best possible way. We have to leave uh, something for the people to read about that later on. We shall continue the WAS talks on science for human security. You will be able to participate in the forthcoming meeting too, and you will be informed about that. Thus, at the end, thank you very much.